the silver wall decoration, uh, not a fragment was known to survive until a flashlight shone behind the side of an architrave showed a little glint of silver. And this was sufficiently interesting for the architrave to be removed. And there behind was the original silver and pearl white wall decoration, uh, very much blackened with tarnishing. We're fortunate that there were some little silver elements visible. And at last, here was the design of Robert Jones from the 1823 scheme. The Robert Jones design that was discovered was, uh, as I say, silver on a so-called pearl white ground. The motif was a, a, an, a small arch shape within which was a flower and it was evident that it was also had a, a shadow colour around it, suggesting it was meant to have a slightly trompe l'oeil three-dimensional effect. The actual motif itself is very similar to one that uh, appears in three dimensions on the ceiling cove of the banqueting room. And while that was also a Robert Jones scheme, the plaster work, which this motif was part of in the banqueting room, would have been John Nash, the architect John Nash's design. So Jones was drawing from an existing element of the design by John Nash. And that's a very, quite an interesting distinction in any interior in the pavilion as to how much one's looking at the work of the architect John Nash and how much one's looking at the work of the designer, either Robert Jones or um, the other great designer of the pavilion interiors, Frederick Crace. It seems that the pavilion is actually unusual and possibly rather groundbreaking in the sense that the, the responsibilities given to the decorators were very broad and uh, John Nash's, the architect's uh, input, was perhaps rather less than might be expected at the time or certainly um, in, a, in a, a generation or so uh, earlier. And uh, Robert Jones himself is uh, mentioned in the accounts of other uh, suppliers of, of furnishings to the pavilion as the designer of the work that they are involved in. So the chimney piece by Westmacott, the furniture supplied by Bailey and Saunders, and uh, other elements are, it, it is always this little suffix which says, to Mr. Jones's design, to Mr. Jones's design. So he wasn't um, just giving form to the idea of the architect. He was very much there uh, at, the, at the creative uh, uh, heart of the job. And his drawings show that. His drawings are almost expressionistic and uh, free uh, designs. You can see his thought processes. He's not um, simply carefully drawing out what he's been instructed to do by someone else. When the silver leaf decoration on the walls was discovered, uh, it, it fell to Anne Soudon to work up a scheme for reconstructing the decoration on the walls. And the fragments we found were relatively small. It was hard to envisage exactly how this would have been planned out across the walls, particularly as Jones's own accounts say that each element was individually uh, shaped and sized to fit into the various situations, as he put it, on the wall. That is to say, he wanted the decoration to come to a natural edge where he, it met a frame and so forth. So it couldn't be printed, which would be the obvious way to do a repeat decoration paper. There were still aspects of it which are slightly mysterious. There, there are some areas which look as if they might have been worked using a stencil, even others which look almost as if they might have been printed, but the, uh, the best preserved areas were obviously done by hand, so it was a hand process directly on the wall originally, we believe. And Anne very carefully plotted out how this would have worked across the walls of the rooms, and once the ground colour and the ground paper had been put on the wall. She had to literally draw every one very finely in pencil on a, a kind of grid that relied on laser devices and plumb lines so that there would be no a waviness, if you like, in, in the scheme. And it took months, as you can imagine. There were around 12,000 motifs and they all had to be placed in exactly the right position. And there was no, as I say, there was, there was 
there were inconsistencies built into Jones's original plan, which she had to bear in mind. And then they had to be recreated. One knew the originals were in silver leaf, but one also knew from other fragments that were discovered that that bright silver finish didn't last very long. Silver tarnishes very readily, and there is evidence that the whole scheme was done again within the period of royal occupancy, a few decades. It might be okay when the client is the king to say, right, let's do it again, it's tarnished a bit. Today, we wouldn't really be able to get away with that, saying, OK, we've got to do the whole room again in 15 years' time. So the difficult decision was made to choose a metal leaf that wouldn't tarnish, and platinum was chosen because platinum doesn't tarnish. It's worth recording that uh, the decision to use platinum wasn't likely taken. I mean, platinum is uh, famously the most expensive metal around. And it's worth recording that um, Anne Soudan acquired this platinum when platinum shares were low, and she used a, a factor who bought enough platinum at a time when the cost of platinum had dipped. Uh, we could not, I think, possibly afford it today. So again, it was one of these extraordinarily fortuitous things that, that made this project so enjoyable, um, as well as rather challenging as well.